Good morning. Thank you. Welcome to Creativity in a Big Data World, whatever that means, um, and we'll get into that. My name is Sean Cochran. I lead digital media and social media at Mullen and Media Hub. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm going to give you a quick background, a really quick background, on why we're having this conversation today and, and what we're going to talk about. At Mullen, we're a creative-centric organization. Um, and obviously, we're looking around the world, just like everyone else, and saying 91% of the people on Earth have a cell phone. You know, the tablet and the smartphone are the two of the fastest, if not the fastest growing, consumer electronic technologies in history. So how do we deal with the changes that are happening there and the amount, vast amount of data that's happening across the board? So we started to have that conversation on who's doing that well? And we said, well, that would be a great conversation for Futurem. Who is really doing that well? Who's tackling that across different creative types of organizations? So we decided to bring together as five great panelists, also known as the panel of mats. Um, just so you know, there are three mats here. Um, so if you ask a question, you have to be very specific on which mat you want to talk to. Um, so we have three mats, and I'm going to let these folks introduce themselves just because I think it's a waste of time for me to do that. Um, but as a former forest analyst, I just wanted to set this up. When we talk about big data, what the heck are we talking about? So really quickly, um, I wanted to kind of just throw some numbers out there. And I always want to start, you know, big data. I want to start with Google. Google's always the company. So I just found some fun stats that I think a lot of us have heard, but I'm going to put them all together here just to give you a sense of what's happened just really recently in, in technology and in data. So Google recently came out and said they have, and I apologize for reading from the phone, but a lot, a lot of data here, uh, 100 billion search queries per month. They just a few months came out and said that's what they're processing now on a daily basis. What was really interesting about that, though, is they actually said that every day they get 500 million new search terms that they've never seen before. So I thought that was a pretty interesting stat. Of course, you have all the social data we always hear about, nearly 5 billion things shared on uh, Facebook every single day across the world. There's 350 to 400 million tweets a day, depending on who you're talking to. Um, Vid, uh, YouTube always has some great stuff. There's 100 hours of video uploaded to YouTube each minute. And then from a, from a viewing perspective, uh, more than 6 billion hours of video are watched on YouTube uh, each month. That's about an hour for every person on Earth and 50% more than last year. Uh, and then you get into those really fun stats that people like to throw out there. Every, every hour, enough information is consumed by internet traffic to fill, to fill 7 million DVDs. Stacked side by side, they scale Mount Everest 95 times. Uh, there are nearly as many bits of information in the digital universe as there are stars in the physical universe. And my favorite one, which I think really kind of shows how fast this is happening, 90% of all data in the world uh, that exists today was created in just the past two years. So lots and lots of data out there, um, lots happening in the technology space. We said, OK, like I said, we wanted to get some people together from the publishing world, from the advertising world, um, and from some of these new kind of roles that are being created because of technology and data in a creativity kind of focused uh, world and, and get them together. So with that, I'm going to now shut up um, and have uh, start with these guys, let them introduce themselves. And they actually brought a, a uh, visual for you, each one of them, because we felt like bringing visuals of like what they're actually talking about would be really helpful for you to see. Um, what does creativity in a big data world look like, and what's it starting to look like now? So with that, I'm going to turn over to Matt Bean um, from Sports Illustrated to talk about who he is, what he does, and, and his example. OK. Uh, question for you before we start of the 5 billion Facebook posts per day. How many of those are cat related? I don't know. Like half. Because that drops <laughs> big data down to like yeah, a, yeah, a meager. Uh, OK, so what you see on the screen here um, is the Twitter 100. It's our third annual celebration <laughs> of all things uh, Twitter. In the sports world, Twitter is a, is a big driver because athletes, coaches, trainers, really everyone can mainline what they're saying to uh, their fans, their friends, um, et cetera. Um, so Sports Illustrated, we've really tried to seize upon that. And each year, develop our Twitter 100, which is a list, uh, a definitive, um, perhaps highly arguable list of the 100 most important people to follow in sports. Now, as you mentioned, of course, there are, f what, 500 million tweets per day, depending on the event. Um, and that's that's very overwhelming, uh, especially in the sports space. And so what we did this year was try to bring that to life by focusing on certain events. So you see at the top, uh, we're looking at Super Bowl. Um, how many people tweeted about the halftime performance? How many people tweeted about the fact that the lights had turned out? Moving on to March Madness, you can see in the drop down, we bring that to life as well. How many people tweeted about the uh, Michigan-Louisville game? Obviously a big thing, Kevin Ware hurt himself during that game and it was one of those oh my god moments. Um, and you see on the left side, people that we recommend following. You can follow them right from that pane. You can actually uh, interact with them there as well. And we use this interface um, to essentially bring the Twitter 100 to life. Uh, we also have deep dives into some of the content um, that you'll see there. There you go. It's loading up. Uh, these are the folks who athletes actually recommended uh, their must-follows. Um, so in all, the Twitter 100 for us is a way to 
um, bring the what we call the atom atom of content it, the most basic piece of content for us it's 140 characters um, to life for our readers and users cool thanks Matt Kramer so I uh, unlike Matt Bean, I have absolutely nothing to uh, to do with the creation of uh, of this this graph here that you see before you. There's a site called Fangraphs that um, will, for every baseball game that's played, will track win expectancy over time in the game. So you'll know which team is most likely to win and by how much. Um, and this is for the second game of the ALCS this year. And you'll see how um, when David Ortiz came to bat late in the game. Um, it was very, I don't know how well this is coming through, but, but it was very much likely that the Tigers were, were going to win um, ahead by four runs. Um, then when Ortiz came to the plate, and I think we can play. They've got Ortiz, who's never homered against Benoit in his career. Bases loaded. Two out. Hard hit into right. Back at the wall, tie game! Big Puppy! The Grand Slam! Oops. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so, but, but basically what you have there is you have this, this incredible swing and in, um, in win expectancy. Like, we, 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 see, we just don't see that that often, especially in... In, uh, in big baseball games. And I guess the point of this, besides just like clearly playing to the Boston crowd um, and being from New York, that's something that has to be done. Um, we, we just see like how ubiquitous like data is becoming. I mean, there's this site called Fangraphs run by a few people. It's a free site and they're, they're out there like tracking this for every baseball game, not just World Series or Championship Series, but like meaningless games played by like the Mariners and the Twins in the middle of August. And um, I think that's the future of data, just like it's just ubiquity. And, you know, then you also have this whole thing we'll get into, but how, how data is now informing baseball strategy and uh, talent recruitment and, and, and stuff like that. So, and then just introduce myself really briefly. Um, I work for an agency called KBS, which for marketing people in the audience, you might better know as Christian Baum and Bond. And I'm an associate creative director there, and I'm also charged with growing the content marketing operation, and we work for brands like BMW, Intel, American Express. Not again. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from because I think I'm a little bit of an outsider here. I'm involved in two... I'm doing sort of two different things right now, and the first is I'm a research scholar at Columbia University in their architecture program, um, specifically in the Spatial Information Design Lab. And the Spatial Information Design Lab has a long history of um, using data and representing it spatially, especially to show kind of um, what's going on socially in the world. Um, I've been involved in a project there over the past year. We've been funded by Thomson Reuters to look at a bunch of different in interdisciplinary projects around the university. One's with, we have all the library data. One, and this is what's up here, is we have shipping data over about 10 years. Um, and then another one is with neuroscience data. And then the other project I'm involved in, which is basically completely separate, is I'm founding this school that's called the School for Poetic Computation. It's in New York. And I'm founding it with three other artists and creative technologists. Um, and it's basically like we're, it's an experiment to see if we can create a kind of hacker school sort of style 10 week program that's more for artists and technologists to come together and, and just explore what they can do creatively together and to sort of also teach artists about technology. Um, maybe you have something that you, know, you want to create but you don't quite know how to get there. Um, that's what that school is about. So when I, the reason that I brought this slide was because this is the very first slot, like the very first thing that I made when, um, when Thomson Reuters gave us a ton of shipping data that they have, and it's a bunch of just basically GPS pings from, um, from ships over the course of a year. It's 11 million points, which isn't, um, which isn't really big, big data. But in terms of visualization, this is sort of big data. 11 million points we can plot, we can just put you know, this way, 
but we can't quite move we can't move 11 million points in a browser yet. Um, so it's it's big in terms of how are you going to represent it. Um, and when I was thinking about what to say here, I sort of thought there's there's creativity to talk about what is creativity, and there's also data to talk about. Data is sort of it's extremely popular now. I, you know, you put data on on a on a talk, and sort of everybody shows up. Um, and I think that what data I th when I think about data and when I work with data, I think of it as a raw material. And I think that that's a good way to approach data. What kind of a raw material is it? So um, sort of I work with artists and you work with watercolor or oil or acrylic or pencil and there's different things that you can make out of that. And data is in its way a very rigid raw material. You sort of have what you have so it's rigid, but it's also, there's all these different ways that you can slice it. So I think of it as sort of this rigid kind of hologram. And how you, how you slice it sort of helps you tell the story. Um, and then the other thing to say about it is that the real power and the power of big data and what's going on right now is our ability to merge data. So it's sort of, data has this collage effect. You can put it together, you can put Twitter together with, you know, how fast somebody's swinging to, together with all these different pieces of data. And that collage effect is what gives you the possibility of telling a story. Um, so I just wanted to start with this picture as just the rawest that data gets and just say that it's always good to get as close to the data you're working with as you can when you're thinking about what story you're going to tell with it. So hi, my name is Rob Murray, and I'm president of Skyward. We are a content marketing, uh, a content management and production platform that enables brands uh, and freelance contributors to to uh, enable brands to produce uh, original content. And uh, today, I just wanted to share a couple thoughts on how uh, we at Skyward see uh, brands using big data to leverage you know, effective content marketing strategies. So here, I sort of showed a couple of different uh, data sources. Obviously, this is not exhaustive. But if you think about the different ways content marketers are leveraging data today, uh, you can look at a Google, a Yahoo, or a Bing, and from there you can, you can actually get relative search volumes. And that can tell you invariably what are trending topics, but it also can tell you or indicate how competitive those keywords and topics you are that you're trying to focus your efforts on. You can look at a Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter and really get a sense of what are trending topics, what are hot topics, what are people caring about today. And then finally, you can look at data sources like Clout, and that will help you uh, actually identify who are the real social influencers out there. Because in today's day and age, uh, online authority is increasingly important to places like Google, and they will give you, you know, they will give uh, what they deem trusted content sources enhanced, uh, enhanced placement in their indexes if they really believe that you're an online authority around a topic area. So this is not exhaustive, but these are different data sources that are available to inform your content marketing strategy. But what's data? You know, data is data. And she's, you know, she, had, Jenna talked about just it's just a raw data input. But what you do with it is probably more important. So as long as your starting point is actually having a thoughtful strategy where you understand who you're going after, what they care about <laughs> right now, because that's an ever moving target. Right now, what they care about this month will be very different next month and then who you want to write to help target these folks, that's really the critical component in this. And then you can go through sort of a, 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 you know, what we would say is a thoughtful production process of creating, managing, and publishing content, amplifying it. That's ultimately where the social influence of your contributor really comes in. The, the greater the online authority, the greater the ability that person can amplify the content. And then finally, measure, refine. You know, it's like rinse, repeat. You gotta do it all over. So this is something that, in our view, is something you're doing constantly. It's not sort of a one-time campaign. And so finally, being sort of a data guy at my roots, I was actually running iProspect for the last 13 and a half years before joining uh, Skyward. Uh, I figured the only way to make this real is to really show, well, how is this driving tangible re results for brands? And so IBM is a, is a client, and they had a very unique challenge in that they were looking to target mid-size executives at mid-size companies. And they had a bit of a reputation problem in that uh, the executives at these mid-size companies thought IBM was either too big for them or really didn't have the relevant uh, product suite to help them with their IT prob uh, problems. So they, we, we helped them and they went out and created a, a dedicated blog where they created content that was aimed at 
education, awareness, and engagement with these executives. And over the last uh, year and a half, they've been able to produce 4,500 relevant and targeted pieces of content towards that audience. And that content's generated over 365 million social impressions, 85,000 social engagements, and over 890,000 page views. And I think where it really, sort of where the real effectiveness of the campaign shows is, this was a relatively non-branded site. 2.4% of the people that visited the site ended up clicking through to an IBM Solutions page, which was their goal at the very outset of the campaign. So not only can you actually, you know, uh, not only can you engage in content marketing, but you can actually do it with real, tangible, measurable results. Matthew Ray, home. Hi, I'm Matthew Ray. I uh, actually work at Mullen as Director of Creative Technology there. And uh, I actually have an interesting background. I started off as a computer science guy, ended up uh, with a fine arts degree. So I'm sort of a, have a, have a mixed background, both brained. I like, I like the technology side, but I also like design and, and creativity as a practice. Um, my slide is actually a little bit different, a little strange. Um, this, is, this is actually called the Catalan Atlas. This is from 1375. The reason I bring this up is because this is a really amazing example of, uh, of what I would consider big data, um, you know, an incredible <laughs> distance from now in the history, in history. So um, the, 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 that document was actually, um, was actually commissioned by, I believe it was a king of France at the time, but uh, it was basically a compendium of all the known knowledge about the world at that time. So if you consider um, the idea of big data and you think about what it really is, um, I think it's always been around. It's just our definition of what big is has changed. Um, if you look on there, you can see everywhere from the architecture to the, to the rulers of each of the kingdoms up there to the actual structure. This is only a few years after Marco Polo actually um, investigated you know, the, uh, the, the, the edges of the known world. So, my, my supposition here would be that it's all about understanding uh, the sources of data that you have, how do you aggregate them, how do you create meaning and value um, by connecting them together in, in, in ways that are, that are uh, consumable by people. So uh, ultimately, you know, the, the, the promise of big data, in, in my opinion, is to take something that's you know, unfathomable by you know, a, a human being or even large groups of human beings and create it into so and turn it into something that we can we can use to uh, to create value meaning and help us tell stories as Jen was saying cool great thanks so let's jump into the conversation here and uh, for this first question I think we're just gonna just go down the row and then we'll start mixing it up so uh, Matt Bean um, I'm gonna start with you and, and what I want to ask you guys about is just everyone here has a little bit of a different role or their role has changed a little bit or dramatically because of what's happened in big, big data and technology in the last couple of years, and everyone's kind of sits in a center of some type of creative role. So I want to start with you. You know, coming from a world like Sports Illustrated, obviously known as a, a traditional, you know, magazine for for decades. You're on the digital side. What has big data and the, the world of technology done to, to change your role and change your role within an organization? Well, I think when you talk about data and sports, you have you have a couple of different uh, buckets. You have stats, which are just massive and never ending, and and someone may want to consume a game flash of the Sox game last night and see who's on first and where the last pitch landed uh, over the plate. Uh, but then you have this tremendous set of data over to the side um, in the social sphere. And so we've been looking for ways as we go through the redesign process to sort of blend those two together um, um, in a way like fan graphs um, so that you're being told a story that it occurs not just on the field but in and around the field as well. Um, you have geotagged Instagram pics um, in and around the stadium. We want to bring those to bear on, on the at-home experience as well. A lot of people talk about second screen, um, and I, I don't really think that's the way we're approaching uh, this project, and I'm not sure that that, I think that may go away um, as a buzzword, um, at least around sports, because what we're trying to do is provide the most compelling story um, of everyone's experience about that game, uh, former players, commentators, fans that are actually at the stadium, as well as um, the stats-driven piece um, that's actually uh, driving the on-field stuff. So uh, my role, in a sense, has been to, to try to figure out what the best blend of those two worlds is. Not every fan wants to know a player's, you know, war rating or wins against replacement. It's, it's a very wonky thing. But if we can take that data and tell it in a, in a compelling way that brings that statistic to life and give it meaning, I think as, as has been said already uh, by other panelists, then, uh, then that's a win for us. So, um, so being at a, like a 
traditional organization that's been around for a long time? I mean, has there been a, like a shock to the system there? Or like how, how difficult or how easy has it been for you to kind of tell, tell stories essentially in a different way? Well, we may get to this later. I know there's yep. uh, the potential to talk about hybrid roles. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that the longer you've been around, um, the more difficult it is to pivot or to essentially green light these hybrid roles. But I think I'm envious of some of my fellow panelists, panelists here because they do truly have those hybrid roles where you're allowed to be someone who's, who's you know, hacking into the servers and trying new things and telling stories, right? I mean, we just came out with a long form project that perhaps is a little bit different from what we're talking about today, but that hybrid role involves somebody that knows HTML and, and CSS and, and JavaScript, but also kerning and great fonts and knows how to find a beautiful image. And it's very rare um, in the past to find someone who has all of those skills wrapped into one because you would go to school to learn pay stuff or, or you would go to school to learn HTML. There were, there were a few places that taught you to do all those things. And so most folks are self-taught. And one of the things I'm trying to do is just bring together interdisciplinary groups across you know, the entire company so that we can identify folks who are good at this and, and clear obstacles so that their creativity can really come to life. Right. Matt Creamer, you're kind of new to the agency world, right? And I think a lot of people may recognize your name from somewhere else. It would be interesting to hear about you know, how your past fits into your current role and what your current role is a little bit. Yeah, so I joined um, the agency world about six weeks ago. So um, uh, I'm rather new, but I'll Welcome. talk like I've been <laughs> you know, there for six decades because I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, so the, the whole, the, the, my role is executive editor of our content labs. And my role is kind of um, exists uh, under the premise that more and more uh, big brands are going to want to produce editorial type content. So, um, and that might mean news websites, it might mean sort of uh, you know, just content engines that, that feed different kinds of social feeds. It might mean print publications, it might mean email newsletters. Um, but the idea is that um, you know, brands themselves are becoming publishers more and more, and um, that takes a different kind of sensibility to manage um, and kind of creative direct within the agency. Um, it's not the kind of interruptive um, corporate messaging model. What we're doing is creating, the idea is to create entertaining or informative content that just happens to be branded and is relevant to the audience we're, our, that our brands are talking to. So, um, so yeah, my, my role is to kind of inject more of a kind of, um, you know, a sort of newsroom sort of sensibility into the operation. And then the flip side of that is I also have a creative director role. So. The idea there is to kind of um, bring an editorial sensibility to the um, kind of traditional creative teams as well where it makes sense. So it's not as though like I'll only touch stuff that comes out of the content labs, but for, for creative programs that make sense, I'll also try to bring um, a different kind of sensibility, one that's maybe built more on being um, you know, informative and authentic and um, you know, shareable uh, you know, where it kind of makes sense. Cool. Jen, I want to ask you about your, your new school. Um, and you talked a little bit about you know having artists and creative technology kind of people together. Who are those people? Other than, uh, Matthew Ray is one I know, um, but they seem to be kind of like unicorns to me. And like, who are they? <laughs> Where do they come from? What do they want to do? What kind of careers are they trying to build? Like, what are, what's the output afterwards? I'm really kind of curious of like, what is that? Yeah. So specifically, a lot of the people. This is the first. We're right in the middle of the first term right now, and a lot of the people that we have are taking sabbaticals from really successful careers with Nokia, with Google, um, Hoffler and Ferrer Jones. Uh, they're they're people that do things like use the Python programming language to create tools to make fonts. So they're, they're people, I mean, I think that a lot of the people that we're working with are people who like to work with complicated problems. And I think that they're sort of, there's this complete overlap between art and science where experimentation lies, where artists, a lot of what artists do is just about experimentation and iteration. And a lot of what scientists do is about experimentation and iteration. And I think it's people who are interested in, in that process of experimentation and iteration. And a lot of what technology requires and a lot of what people who code requires is just an absolute willingness to make mistakes over and over and over because the act of coding is the act of 
writing something down, having it fail, fixing it, having it fail, fixing it, having it fail in a different way. And just being willing to keep doing that iteration until you get something that works. Um, so I think it's people who are willing to sit through a lot of small failures to get to something that um, is really sort of beautiful and moving. Um, yeah. I was going to say a couple other things about how things have changed in terms of yeah, moving to big data. Yeah. Just your initial question. Yep. Um, and so, like, just a few things. Um, practically, uh, it means that everybody needs to learn how to work with data on Amazon Web Services or on, in the cloud. Like, your data just doesn't fit on your laptop anymore, so there's this really practical consideration. Um, I have a lot of people, there's this huge trend towards what I call put some Twitter on it. Like, a lot of people sort of, uh, you know, approach me. Like, people want Twitter on things. They want exactly what the first thing was that Matt showed. Like, they want Twitter on it. So, and also this idea of sentiment analysis of Twitter and the, the idea that you can, um, you know, you have these maps of what's the most racist state and that kind of thing. Twitter being used for all kinds of analysis and people sort of approaching me to do those things. Um, I think that because the big data is coming from humans, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity opened up to talk about um, ethics and privacy and where the data is being collected from and that kind of thing. And then the last thing I was just going to say was that hybrid roles, what Matt said about hybrid roles, that that's, to me, that's becoming more and more important in terms of what creativity means now. I think creativity means more and more um, being able to be a hybrid person, or if not that, being able to like work on a hybrid team. I'm working a lot more with, and I'm, I'm really personally excited about the idea of just hybrid teams, just people who can collaborate and kind of sit with across technology and art and creativity and sit in those boundaries and work well with others. So, yeah. Cool. Go ahead, Matt. Tell us about Skyward and differences in what you've seen. So, uh, at, uh, at, at Skyward, we actually don't produce any content. Uh, all we do is we actually enable brands and agencies to become content publishers. So this uh, concept of a newsroom is something we hear a lot about uh, at Skyward. There, there's a definite appetite out there uh, to create these real-time newsroom environments. Uh, and there's a unique challenge, uh, you know, as, as you think about the newsroom environment, you're talking real-time. Uh, you're talking response times in hours, not in days and in weeks. And how you actually work with folks to enable them to have that rapid response time is something that we have to think a lot about, uh, not only in how we actually design software, but in how we actually enable people to actually operate the software and the time, you know, the space, the time, the location, wherever it is. So we kind of have to be real time, and we see that a lot lately. This kind of always on mentality is something we see a lot of. I think the other thing that was brought up here is something about sort of new roles. Uh, and um, one thing, uh, certainly 2013 in our world is the, is the world of the content strategist. It's the, it's the year where everyone seems to be hiring a content strategist. So are we, if anyone's looking. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, th that's a good sign, I think, for the uh, industry as a whole in that, you know, we're starting to get to the point where, where companies are starting to realize that content is not something that just kind of gets put off to the side and, you know, you'll have a couple of your you know, your nephews from college or home for a summer break, kind of managing some Twitter, some Facebook or something. Content's always on, which is a good thing, and companies are taking it more seriously. A and they're voting with their checkbooks and the types of the people and the nature of the people they're bringing into the organizations. And I think that's actually really a good thing for the evolution uh, of the content industry. Yeah, in terms of roles changing, I mean, my, my, first, my first job when I got out of college was doing CD-ROMs, multimedia <laughs> CD-ROMs, so I can say certainly that roles have changed quite a bit. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ubiquity of uh, you know, sharing information, um, the internet, social media, the, the one thing that I would say is the constant is that anything that you learn is going to be obsolete within a matter of years, like a few years. And um, I think that's the, the, the one thing to keep in mind for anybody who sort of wants to work in can this get, field. Can you give us an example of that? Because I think it would be good. Like a certain type of code. Like what is it? Well, being? like for example, like CD-ROMs. Like that, that was, <laughs> that, that, was a, you know, <laughs> that was one. Like ling lingo was an awesome language when, it, when, when I used it like a long time ago. Or Flash. Or Flash, you know, which is what I did after I learned HTML. <laughs> I got CD-ROMs down pretty good uh, at one point. So. 
but I, I think that the, the, the critical thinking and creative thought processes are something that don't change. I think that's how do you take these tools that you have, learn the tools, then use the tools to create something that helps you, like we said, tell a story, communicate something, make something meaningful for somebody. So to me, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the roles are changing. You do need a lot of different types of people. You need, you need a lot of specialists that can work together as, you know, as a group hive mind. You know? like how, do you, how do you make this sort of collective of people that can finish each other's sentences but have deep understanding of these different practices that can make what you're, you're putting together um, uh, you know, even even more amazing. I mean, the the y you hear stories. I mean, I brought up a historical reference earlier, but there's also a, plenty of other historical references for people who were able to do amazing things that had deep knowledge in lots of different areas, like a one one man band of of of, of innovative thought. I think that's that's you can still see that every now and then, but it's getting more and more difficult. And um, by being able to have uh, people that can communicate together and that have disparate and different backgrounds. I think if you can get somebody that, you know, your team makeup of somebody who's working on, pr uh, the team that's working on a project, if you can get people from different backgrounds working on solving a problem, you're going to get a different solution based on the teams that you, the, the, cool. the, the members of that team. So um, I guess the, the big question is, what is the ideal outcome of that, of that project and how do you, based on that, build a team of, of people that can work together from different disciplines that can help steer the, the right. output of that. So we've gone down the road a couple times, so we can just start jumping in and make this a little more interactive. But Matthew, I'm going to follow up on a question like that because I think you know, one of the questions I want to ask the panelists is just about, you know, we talk a great deal, I think a lot of times in these types of scenarios about you know, finding those hybrid teams and bringing these really great people who really understand data and technology and then bringing them together people who are like really just kind of right brain, creative, kind of out there, whatever it is, um, in that more traditional creative sense, I guess. I think it's in, ideally it sounds great, and I think in pockets it works, but how do you make it work all the time, and is there a lot of tension there? I mean, can those two really kind of work, left brain, right brain, however you want to term it, can they really work you know, harmoniously together? And, and what's your experience with that? Um, and then I just, you guys feel free to jump in and talk about what, what, you know, what you've experienced. Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen some amazing examples of it, people who have only been script writers, who then, amazing script writers, amazing writers in general, who um, have suddenly realized the power that embracing these technologies gives them and, 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 and lets them do so much more than they could do before. And once somebody sees that, it's, it's, it's sort of intoxicating. That's all that they want to do because now they realize they can do so much more than they could do before just by writing a TV spot or just by doing, um, you know, uh, uh, you know some, uh, a clever headline. So I've seen a lot of cases where um, people can embrace it uh, and really switch gears. They have to want it. I think that's the big thing is, is to see the value in it, to be... Um, immersed in um, uh, the excitement of, of, of people who are uh, in this field. I think a lot of people who, who sort of straddle this line um, are really passionate because they see the, the, um, the, the, the promise of what they're doing and making stuff that people have never seen before, have ever used before. So I think that's, that's the big thing is it, it can be difficult. I think if people have an open mind and they see the value of uh, and can be presented the value of, the, of, of being able to uh, uh, to, to collaborate and, and sort of expand their, um, their, their minds and sort of dedicate part of their skill set to a team of people that can help make something more uh, than the sum of its parts. The whole theory of gestalt, you know, you have to, you know, it's, it's not about what each one person can bring, it's about how do you bring those people together to make something awesome, so. That's cool. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll add on. Uh, from my perspective, looking in at, 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 at uh, clients and, and agencies that we work with, uh, I would still say that there still is, uh, you know, probably more silo mentality, uh, you know, in those worlds than probably should be today. Uh, but there are pockets, spe specifically client side. I'll see specific client teams around specific product launches being able to take, you know, that that unified group of, in, you know, creating an integrated marketing team of multidiscipline, you know, with data and insights at the core, right. focused on a particular launch. Is there a consistent thing though, like, or is it just kind of like? Magic happened, and we were lucky. Serendipitous because uh, these people came together. Is there something that you see that like someone's doing? Well, I'm I, asking something. Yeah, so. no, I, I, I do. I do think you know it starts with leadership and foresight at, at you know within the client. You have to you have to be given. You either have to have, to have someone who doesn't ask for permission, or or a boss that really gets it and is going to say, look, this is what we need to do and drive it through. Specifically with clients, or just yeah, on the client agency. side and on the agency clients side. Clients are wonderful. I don't ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clients are awesome. Yeah. Um, but uh, but then you know within the agency world, this this creative newsroom concept, I see a lot of folks really gravitating around that, and that is an area where 
they are definitely separating out. I mean, like in physical locations, creating physical locations around creative newsrooms where they're bringing multiple discipline teams together. Is it working? I mean, and I, I, I have, you know, a bias Matt, as being a social media lead and agency, but I'm curious. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. Just, Matt, you can I, jump in on actually, this too. But. Actually, I'll, I'll let Matt from the agency side, but but from where we see, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of appetite, you know, and it, is it going to work uh, the, the first time dead right? No, it's an iterative process where you learn from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's definitely, uh, certainly a, a something, a trend we're going to see in, 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 in for the foreseeable, and I do see it working. Yeah, I think... I think it's it's one of those things that'll work when um, you don't try to apply a kind of one size fits all process process to it. I mean, for some brands that are a little bit more out there and willing to take chances, I mean, you can kind of you know apply a newsroom concept and you can try to get them publishing something close to real time. For others, it's going to be baby steps, and you know there's going to be a you know a six week approval process, and maybe over time you shorten it to four, and then keep on going. But um, you know, you I think it's it's you have to be um, adaptive to where you know clients' heads are and what they're what they're comfortable with doing. I think the main thing that's that needs to be there is kind of an understanding of what you're trying to do and making sure that you know they're not just doing it you know in this case content marketing because it's the next big thing. I mean this idea of like putting some Twitter on it. I mean, I think to kind of swing this back to data, there's a lot of like, put, let's put some data on it. And you know, you'll see, um, you know, because it's become like, a th to, to, to release an infographic has become like a thing to do. Um, everybody wants to do it, whether they have a data story to tell or not. So, you know, it's a little bit like, we just want a pretty picture with our brand out there. And there's a lot of this stuff out there that doesn't really have a data story behind it. So you ha it kind of goes back to like, does the, does the client kind of get that like what you're doing is it's th the star of this is the data and you have like a message and that message probably isn't the same thing as whatever is in your, you know, in your brand deck. I, I mean, it's interesting you wrote infographics because personally I think 90% of inf infographics I see suck. I'm just gonna be honest. I think they suck. I think they do and I'm just I'm confused by what they're trying to, to your point, and there's just a bunch of stuff and I have to scroll and I'm like, I don't, you know. You should do, make an infographic about that. I, I should. That's a good idea. We'll write that down. Um, I mean, what do, you, what do you guys think on that? I mean, uh, data visualization has become really popular and I think we've seen some really interesting examples of it. Jen, Jen's was an interesting example and, and Matt showed one, Matthew showed one from a long time ago. Um, but, you know, I think people just kind of get caught up in what's, what's trendy instead of trying to tell a great story and I think that's I think that's true. I just I think again it kind of goes back to like is it you know where is your data coming from? Is it is it is it strong? Is there something new to be said? I mean obviously yeah you can work with outside partners for the the sort of visualization of it and the distribution of it, but I think this stuff works best when like they're your 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 kind of data rich organization and you're you're looking to throw stuff out there versus just trying to promote yourself through kind of what's seen as a new marketing tactic. I, I mean I, I definitely see that in that a, a lot of folks just think uh the, the biggest part of the infographic is the creative. The biggest part of the infographic is the underlying data and the story. The creative actually should be very easy if you have a strong story and you know and and, and supporting data. That the underlying creative or the uh, the outline creative should be the easy part of it. But people think oh, I'll just get a really cool creative and throw some story around it and get it out there. I think that infographics are popular. In the, it, it's just basically like put a number on it, like you know, sprinkle some data on it, put some Twitter on it, put a number on it. I think that it's this infographics are popular. I think in the same way that listicles are popular. There, it's you know, it's very easily consumable. You don't have to think very hard about complexity. It's just put a number on it, and people sort of trust numbers, and and that's. They're never sourced. It drives me crazy. But anyway. It's yeah, just, you know, yeah. Yeah. Enough of me and my infographic hate. But um. You know, I, I want to ask you guys about challenges, and you know, Matt. What do you, I mean, Matt, being, I'll, I'll ask you this. Like, in terms of what are you seeing in your organization, or just in your job in general, that's just challenging in terms of bringing, you know, data and technology and creativity together. Like, what are the things that you're struggling with and you're trying to overcome? Well, we'd we'd like to operate like a Montessori and just have a bunch of really creative people and say, let her rip. Let's come up with some cool stuff. But the realities of our business don't, unfortunately, allow us to do that. So, um, there's a lot of coalition building. Um, there's a lot of active outreach for partners on the advertising side who are willing to help us try new things. And if we have that partnership intact, then a lot of the, the barriers just fall away because there's there's actually revenue against it. You know, there, there's a clear goal that's appreciated on both sides um, of the divide as to what we are trying to accomplish. Um, so it, it does at times feel like politics in a way rather than creativity. Um, but what I think has worked best for us 
is, is walking before we run. I mean, we have this goal of, of on the long form side of things, doing this regularly because we've been, we've been telling great narratives since 1954. Well, that doesn't mean we can all of a sudden just go ahead and do it, drop everything that we're doing, not cover games, not do power rankings, not occasionally do listicles, unfortunately. But, um, you know, but just coming out with our first example of that, we didn't have any ads on it. We, di we, we didn't make a big announcement about some regular cycle or anything. We didn't put out press releases. Just having something people could see and experience um, and, and appreciate um, went an incredibly long way toward paving the way for doing that down the road. Right, get a win and then go from there. Get a win. And, and, and again, talking about that sort of hybrid space. I mean, we have established IT departments and rules, and they're, they're very good rules because if we just come up with something crazy and, and somehow create a fissure in our firewall that can be hacked or something, then, then I would be out of a job. So um, it's, it's creating partners on all sides of our teams um, that understand where we're trying to go with this. And for us, you know, creating proof of, proofs of concept and, and iterating on that has been the most effective way. It's perhaps not the easiest way to do it, but um, it's the most effective. Right. You know, Matthew, it'd be good to hear about your experiences at Mullen and, and talking about you know, building a, a new creative technology team and, or, or adapting to one that we already had. And yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on you know, challenges. Yeah, I mean, I think every, every organization is different and every organization has, like you said, the, their own specific challenges they need to work on. Um, I think the, the um, you know, specifically in, in the big data sort of world is that, you know, beyond just creativity and technology, it's, it's how, how, do you, how do you get the um, sort of the chicken or the egg problem, like how do you get clients to move in that direction, um, and then how do you build a team to be able to make the things that the clients need to buy? So it's sort of like there's a there's a give and take there of like where do you start and do you make the work, prototype it, get it out there, get clients to buy the spec work, or do you try to find just go out and try to find clients that want to buy what you want to sell? It's sort of like more of a more of a self marketing thing to be able to figure out how do you. What, where do you, what is the long-term goal? What, and honestly, it's, it's, it's a bigger question in terms of the industry. So uh, advertising, what is it going to be long-term? You know, we've talked a lot about you know, trading desks and how data is controlling the advertising conversation and um, what is the role of creative in that, in that, in that new world. And I think that you know, being able to help invent that what the future is going to be is, is, is one of the key parts and, and, and getting people on the team who are excited to help define what that's going to be and have aren't sort of encumbered by the past and have um, see the value that um, creative teams within agencies, the things that they can do that maybe you can't get as easily in other places and how do you use that as your strength as a point to start off from to be able to figure out well what is what is the value of you know this sort of motley crew of people moving forward to be able to, to make something new and different and you know it's honestly the the I, I have a feeling that you know Advertising ten years from now, you know the the my text that, that's happening, you know, in ten years is going to be a lot different than the one that's happening. I now. hope so. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, t to me, that's the exciting part is helping define what that is going to be and figuring out. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I feel like I'm in advertising second. I'm making useful, um, compelling, and uh, stories for people, making things of value for people, and that's the thing that's the most interesting, and that's where you should start off from, and uh, and and you know, I think that's a that's a way to get better better in product. But that brings me back to the question of talent. So to me, is do people who are really or that are really creative with with data in the space that we you know we look for in the marketing world or other worlds, like what do they what do they want to be doing? Do they want to be working in our world? Do they want to be working in other worlds? Like that's I mean that's there's a there's a, I would say there's a talent crunch right now because there's a lot of startups in the space. There's a lot of big technology companies in the space, and there's a lot of agencies that want to be in this space too. So you're seeing sort of a a nexus of interest between all of these different groups. And you know Google's a great example. Is Google an agency? Is it a provider? Is it both? Is it a competitor? I, I don't know. It's sort of all, all of those things, um, and it's riding a very fine line between the middle of all those things. So I think it's, uh, th there is a talent crunch. I think agencies need to do a good job of figuring out, you know, from, from, uh, from their business perspective, how, what is the value that, that agencies can bring to the table that maybe some of those other places can't? Like, what can you get at an agency that you can't get at a startup or you can't get at a, um, at a big technology company, and it's that that's going to be the strategy that you have to take to be able to get the best talent out there. Um, I think everybody knows what the good talent is. I mean, everybody sees like that's that person's awesome. I would love to work with them. 
um, the problem is, is there's a lot of what, what does that person want to do, and is what you're producing the kind of thing they want to work on. Right. So you have to look look backwards. <laughs> Yeah, and then it's like, how do you fit them into the the structure that you've got? You know, I mean, when you've got like the kind of art director slash copywriter structure that that ad agencies have you know kind of clung to for decades, I mean, you know, how do you fit like you know data into that? And even in creative technology departments, I mean, you know, you have other kinds of structures forming, and you know, it doesn't th this sort of you know the uh, information design architect or whatever kind of you know data data uh, title we might use, like it doesn't fit naturally into that. And you know, I think agencies can be kind of hostile, you know, to, to people who don't fit into those, those established structures. So, I think it's there, there's a huge, um, you know, the, the burden really is on agencies to kind of have the, you know, the, the kind of willingness to experiment and and just and the patience to see how these people will will kind of fit into the organization. From where we sit, I mean, certainly uh, agencies are definitely having to break down sort of old world silos, and we're seeing that happen. Uh, quite a bit. We actually did a research paper over the summer where we interviewed a lot of uh, executives that lead digital agencies on how they are addressing these challenges. Uh, and, and it was very interesting that, you know, being just so much more customer centric versus channel specific was the message you heard repeatedly is just have to break down the silos and have to build it around. It's not going to be easy and it's going to be a little choppy as you get through that. But it was definitely a trend we're seeing that a lot of people are, are discussing. Right. I can tell you from working with Matthew and knowing what Matt's going through, it's, it's fun. Uh, it's challenging, but it's fun. Um, so I have one last question for you guys, and I'm going to open it up to questions for everyone else. So I'm just going to go down the row again and start with Matt Bean and um, just ask you, like, in terms of what do you expect to see in the next one to two to three years, that kind of short-term window of what's going to happen in this space? Do you see any big milestones happening? And what, what's your kind of crystal ball telling you of you know, what you're keeping your eye out for and what you're, what you're focused on? Specifically with respect to data? Yeah, data and creativ creativity. You know, I, I think we're going to see some changes in how we present information in the sports space. Um, I think we've already sort of begun to see that with um, increased digital viewership of sports. Um, we have become perhaps a little more focused on the highlights and the GIFs lately. Um, and I think there'll be a blending of those two worlds as um, people start playing with things like popcorn.js and they can trigger on-screen overlays at certain playhead points in the video. Um, you know, sports really is about what happened, what was that great play, let me see that again in, in the greater sense. Um, and I do think that there'll be some unique ways of blending those two things. Maybe that's a little bit further down the road. Um, but there's definitely this melding of the social graph with um, real time um, video that I think is going to change the way people consume sports uh, information. I, one thing I, I must say, as much as we're trying to reinvent every last thing in this space, you know, we looked at something that's really the, the, the bedrock of sports information. We've all got baseball in the brain right now, particularly in Boston. It's the box score. And we tried to reinvent that thing a million times in the process of this redesign. We had graphs, we had things flying all over the place. And then finally we just realized, you know what's really great is the box score. <laughs> um, and it's been around since baseball was invented and it gives you everything you need to know. So we haven't necessarily sounded this note in the process of talking about the, the future. Uh, but sometimes, you know, data as it exists is, is perfectly fine and we need to make sure that we're not reinventing things for the sake of reinventing right. them. So. Right. Um, so I think, you know, in the agency world, um, we think of data's role as kind of be, being like a, a kind of creative output. So it's, we talk about infographics or data visualization, but I think in the future we'll start to think more about how data can underlie and sort of inform other kinds of, of communication that aren't data viz, that aren't like that where you don't see the data come through. And I mean, to pick a kind of really trivial example, but like how how are tweets that we write for clients like informed by like sh social staring statistics and not just kind of tethered to brand guidelines and how can how can consumer data actually not be something that competes with brand voice but kind of actually inform brand voice um, and I think like that's that that for me is like the kind of next frontier and it, it it's a there are a lot of challenges with that just because there are clients out there who just don't want to hear that the consumers are doing something different from what they want them to be doing. So, um, you know, there's a kind of big bridge to be crossed there. Cool. Um, I think that 
I can't, I, I, I'm not in this space where I can really predict what the sort of future of big data and marketing is. I think that I'm definitely with Rob that real time is gonna be, I think there's gonna be a lot of, of real time. Um, people are gonna have interest in that and, and more and more people are moving towards trying to make data visualizations of, of things in real time and I think that that's gonna be huge. Whether or not that's good or bad or useful or not, I think that that's gonna be a big thing. Um, and then I think, that, I think that we've all been sort of talking towards this idea of hybrid teams and hybrid people and I think that big data is the, the way that we're talking about it is a recently possible thing, and that um, I think that those hybrid, finding people who can work together in those hybrid teams um, is gonna be really important. And that I don't know quite what those people are gonna make, like I, I don't feel comfortable predicting the future of what those people are gonna make, but um, I think that those are the types of people who are gonna make it. Uh, I think in the content world, I think we're gonna see a continued uh, reliance on the social web and social graph and social influence in terms of really I identifying who your, who your true audience is and how you can actually reach them and, and the nature and the importance of social influence and how you start to uh, create relationships uh, through social influence uh, around the web. I think that's going to gain continued importance here, certainly from the content marketing perspective. Um, I, I I tend to think if you if you take the concepts of creativity and big data and combine them, I think one thing that's sort of comp completely obvious right now is that that context is really important, and almost letting those two things help define uh, the the interfaces, the experiences that people have based on the context that they're in. Um, I think you know it'll be a, a little bit of a of a rocky process at first, where people are used to. Um, interfaces and, and, and experiences that are consistent all the time. I think as time goes on and data can be better leveraged to be able to create, custom create experiences for people, that that expectation will slowly disappear. Um, I don't know if it'll be three years from now, it might be five years, it might be longer than that. Um, people tend to, to hold on to the, to the, um, uh, the affordances that they're used to for quite a while, but um, expanding the perspective and maybe creating new types of ways of interacting with with content information, utility, uh, to be able to uh, bring people the things they need uh, even before they need it, even before they know that they need it. And that's sort of the creepy factor. Google deals with this a lot. Like, you know, if anybody's ever used Google now, it's like, how does it know? Um, but it's, uh, they know everything. And it's the, the, the challenge is like, how do you take these in, enormous, you, you mentioned the stat before about, you know, was it 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years? that's going to continue to exponentially grow. And like the challenge is gonna be, how are you gonna make meaning out of that data? How are you going to combine it, cross-reference it, and turn it into something valuable so you don't just end up being, you know, having hordes of data, but not, no, not being able to do, use it for anything. Right. So that's the big challenge, I think, moving forward, is being able to leverage that in a, in a meaningful way. And, and, and honestly, sort of, you're, I think you'll see, you mentioned a little bit about roles, but who are the people that are going to be able to do that? <laughs> like, who are the people that can look at a pile of data, the data whisperers, and be like, wow, you can connect these things together, and how do you make, draw meaning and, and connections, almost like investigators behind the data? Right. Cool, so we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, I don't think we have microphones, so if you're in the back or you're just shy, feel free to tweet it at my, me. Uh, Twitter handle's up there. Also, if you have a question for a specific Matt, please let us know which Matt names are up on, on the board. Actually, I, I know of one of Boston. It's a it's a startup out of Cambridge, the Startup Institute. Uh, that that they're you know I, I look at what they're doing and I say hey that's a you know I think that's a step in the right direction and uh, I think what they're doing is pretty good. So I mean that's certainly the w one area where I would certainly get yourself involved in. 
I'd say there's, a, there's been a couple efforts of this. I know some of my um, Mullen folks and ex-coworkers were working to, to, with the University of Colorado to put together Boulder Digital Works. That was a program. There's a couple other programs that are starting to expand in this in this space to sort of like create these hybrid thinkers um, that can that can you know come from multiple different disciplines and know how to work together in the space. So I think you're you're starting to see some of the the, the educational programs change. I mean, I, I wish I had some of these programs when I was in school because uh, you you had to create your own way in a lot of ways, but. Um, I think that's going to happen over time. I've, I've been seeing more of that, and you know, Gen School is sort of an interesting <laughs> example as well. Like these are these are people that you know, this, that kind of a program really didn't exist in its current form until now. So, cool. Other questions? It's kind of why companies like uh, Delphic and companies like that are starting to kind of come up that they're trying to help you identify, get more robust data and understanding more information around your mobile consumer that, you know, a lot of the carriers control a lot of the information. So there's always going to be that role who's, who really owns the data and who's going to provide what to whom. Uh, so a lot of it is sort of algorithmic assessments and associations. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely companies out there, and I, I know there's one on the West Coast, and I'm forgetting the name of it, where they're able to map your iPhone to your iPad and link you. Yeah. So they will make that connection between your iPhone and your iPad and, and make that association. So when they're targeting you, they will actually hit you, and they can actually make sure that they're hitting you with the same message uh, and not inundating you. Yeah, there's companies like Flurry on the app side and uh, Media Let's on the advertising side. A lot of them are using more pattern recognition to say instead of cookies because they don't always have the cookie data um, to use that. So there are some opportunities, but it is a challenge um, tying device behavior or even getting device behavior and tying it back to, to real people. Other questions? Nope. Oh, is there one? Sorry, go ahead. We, uh, from my perspective, understanding user behavior, I mean, we, we've used a lot of different tools in the past. A lot of times we work with what the clients have. So that's, that's the biggest challenge is um, sometimes we can bring, um, we can bring the um, you know, suggestions in, in, in cases where uh, there's points of evaluation. Um, you know, I think the, the, the biggest, you know, the biggest names are mainly tied to sort of web analytics, but if you're trying to do sort of larger scale uh, data, like OLAP analysis, things like that. We were trying to do multi-dimensional analysis. Um, that's where the cost of those things are pretty large compared to uh, um, the you know, cost of things like Google Analytics, which are free. <laughs> so um, there has to, typically those kinds of decisions are, in my experience, have been uh, facilitated by our clients since they have other needs in, internal to their organization that, um, that require um, Mul more business requirements than we would have for them. So in a lot of cases, we're, we're brought in on an agency technology side to help evaluate a series of, of, uh, of finalists. But um, that's that, from my perspective, that's the primary. I don't know if anybody else has any other. I mean, I can just say most of the time when large agencies and big publishers are working with uh, and big brand websites are working with you know, web analytics tools like Adobe Omniture, or Google Analytics, and those types of tools. And then you're trying to tie back a bunch of other data, which we talked about, which can be really messy when you start to look at social data like Twitter, uh, use like Topsies and Netbases and those type Radiant Sixes, those types of tools to pull on that data. And then you have search data. I mean, it just gets really kind of sloppy and messy. So I wish I could tell you there's an easy answer to that. There is not. Uh, it's a mess. You should investigate Chartbeat if you haven't already for real-time analytics. Chartbeat, it's like manna from heaven. <laughs> um, it helps to change the culture. It's very accessible. 
I mean, I work in the content space, so this really only applies if you're trying to see who's hitting certain pages, but we use it um, in real time. We have a big plasma TV up in the newsroom so that everybody knows where everyone's at. I mean, it actually tells you there are 30,000 people in this story right now, and here's where they came from, versus on Richard, which you can go in, get hourly data, but it's not as tactical. All right, with that, we're out of time. I just want to say thank you to the three Mats and Jen and Rob, and thank you to all of you for coming up. Thank you.